So Ron, it's lovely to see you here at Collectivania nice to today. We loved you in Game of Thrones Thank as Sir Roderick Cassell. What were your favourite memories and scenes of being in that show? Oh, just from start to finish, it was a really good, good fun show to be involved in. Uh, I started on the pilot uh, before we went to series, and that was a great experience because you know everybody's just it's a single cast, and you're looking to get something very exciting off the ground. And so that was you know hard work, but very concentrated, a uh, very sort of collegiate feel to it all. So that was uh, when we found out it had been successful. It was just an excellent, excellent feeling. And then the series itself was just lovely. I had a really, really good time doing it. A lot of good actors, you know, good chums. So splendid. And now we've got so many memories of your scenes. Remember when you were resting Tyrion at the inn as well? Yeah. That was incredible, wasn't it? It was. It was fab. I mean, uh, that was quite early on because uh, we, we shot uh, out of order in the first series. So we did, I think, four, five and six. We shot them early on. Uh, in fact, my first my first three days were the big ambush where there's a lot of prior, you know, just after the uh, the arrest. Uh, but no, the inn, uh, the inn at the crossroads was great stuff to do. You know? Again, like so much of it, you walk onto the set and you just go, look at this. I mean, you know, the the decoration, the food, the you know, all the other people that are there dressed on the set. It, it's uh, from that point of view, from an actor's point of view, you know, the the detail and the attention that's put into the the settings is just magnificent. I was I worked on some really wonderful sets like the uh, the the Eerie where the uh, the trial by combat took place, you know the Moon Door and and all that stuff. I mean, just you know, gigantic, wonderful things to to be part of. I mean, when you're an actor and you walk onto something like that, is it still kind of a sense of awe, even if you've been filming on it for a few days? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really exciting. I mean, you know, you, you get used to it very quickly, but walking onto it for the first time, you get a real sense of scale and. A real sense of you know the size of the thing that that you're part of. Uh, lovely. Of course, you unfortunately lost Sir Roderick far yeah. too soon, didn't we? And but what a way to go, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, even in the show where people die on a fairly regular basis, it was uh, it was a good death, I think. You know, sad, splendid, and uh, you know, good good feedback for it. And if you you know if you're going to go, and nearly all of us in House Stark do end up going one way or another, you know, at least it's quite nice to go out in style great lines you had in those final moments as well I mean what did you think when you got that script oh I got the script I looked and I thought mm, yes we can we can do this this will be lovely and also you know playing it with with Alf and with Donald and with the boys you know and we'd all done so much work together over the couple of years uh, the kids particularly have been a real a real joy for all of us to work with so it was lovely uh, I think the boys were genuinely upset on the day as well you know it was sad for them but uh, uh, and Christian as well. It was just uh, yeah, hard work and yeah, emotionally very intense, but uh, a, good, a good ending, I think. A good ending for a good character. Yeah. I don't know how much you followed the show. I mean, obviously your son Dan's in there as, as Podrick Payne, brilliant character, a great young actor. But I don't know if you've seen what's been happening to Theon lately. Poor old Theon, yes. I mean, he has, uh, he's paid for his perfidy, hasn't he? I mean, uh, I, th yeah, I think... I'm one of the people that thinks Theon's probably had enough. You know, there, there comes a point where, you know, punishment and retribution and, you know, I suppose karma. You know, it, I think he's probably paid now for for what he's done. He says he is a poor lost soul, and I don't see any redemption for him. Sadly, I can't, I can't see any way that he can dig himself out of the, the terrible hole that he's dug himself into. Such a hard storyline to watch, isn't it? But compelling nonetheless. I mean, talking about characters and their various kind of fates along the way, I mean, what kind of qualities do you think you need to survive or even thrive if you can in that very harsh world of Game of Thrones? I think that's what George is writing about principally, is you know, the balance between personal values and, and public responsibility. And it's, you know, you have on the one hand, you have the Stark family who do have this, you know, very solid, very commendable sense of honour, but it hasn't profited them or the people that they're supposed to be looking after at all. I mean, their their sense of justice and their sense of honour is so inflexible that they all end up paying for it. On the other hand, you don't want to be, you know, like the Lannisters or Littlefinger, who are, you know, you know, just completely immoral people with no sense of values beyond doing what they can for themselves at any given time. So I think what George is looking for is is is, is a balance between the two. And what he writes is, you know, a, a great fable about how difficult it is to, to achieve that balance. You know, to, to be a, to be a good person in a very very bad world. That's I think one of the things that makes his writing so, 
it's, you know, so wonderful, just beyond the simple storytelling. What have you enjoyed most about watching Dan on the screen and how do you feel about how his character pods developed? <laughs> well, it's just been, it's been fantastic for us watching him. Uh, you know, he's had some very good moments. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Blackwater was the first time that he really came into to prominence rather than just being the sort of, you know, the bumbling boy in the background. You know, when he, uh, the fascinating thing about Pod as a character is that the only time he seems to be capable is, you know, either in, in a bedroom surrounded by young women or on a battlefield surrounded by big men when he just focuses and does everything that's required. And then he just sort of goes mm, mm, you know, back into himself again. Uh, I enjoyed his his uh, farewell with Tyrion very much. I mean, I thought the two of them were just were just lovely. Uh, but the whole relationship, the sort of triangular relationship between Tyrion and Pod and Bronn was lovely. Just these, you know, these two very much older, more experienced men in very different ways and, and their sort of surrogate son. And again, interestingly in what you're talking about, you know, how do you try to be good in, in a bad world? You had both those men, you know, Tyrion, the, the great politician, and Bronn, the great warrior, and, you know, both hardly sentimental men, but both of them in their very different ways trying to be as good as possible to, to this rather sort of lost, uh, seemingly incapable boy. So that, that was, that's all been great to watch. It's interesting to see now Dan as well as Pod with Brienne, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that'll be very interesting to see, you know, a very, very different relationship uh, developing there. But uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens with Pod. But I think everybody knows now that uh, you know, there's, there's more to Pod than meets the eye. Now, of course, um, you mentioned George R. R. Martin. When you got the edition, you were reading avidly all the books, yeah. weren't you? I wonder what you'd like to see happen in this next book that he's got to come out, Winds of Winter. Well, I guess, uh, you know, if George sticks to his original plan and we've got a cycle of, of seven books, I suppose what, what's bound to be happening now is that he'll be focusing and he'll be honing things down and, and moving you know, towards whatever conclusion he's, he's decided upon. You know, like everybody else, I've, I've no idea. You know, I've got my own ideas like everyone, what's going to happen. But uh, I guess what he'll start to do is you know, bring his very, very wide and you know, big canvas into sharper detail now. I would guess that's that's what's bound to happen. You know, we've got all these disparate storylines on Westeros, Essos, with the you know with the, the Greyjoy clan at sea now. I think we need obviously us to start coming to whatever ever climax he's he's going to uh, to aim for. So I guess book six, you know, we'll be moving in that direction, and then the the final book, if that's what it ends up being, uh, it will be just you know all hands to the pumps, see what happens next. I mean, if you could have any character on that throne at the end of the day, who would you like to see? And also, if you could have been any other character in the show, who would you like to swap with? Oh, well, I like being Roderick very much. Uh, my favourite character, is, you know, it's like everybody, somebody says, who's your favourite Game of Thrones character? And you go, well, my top five, I suppose. Uh, I would like to have been Davos. He's one of my great favourites because he's, you know, similar qualities to Roderick. You know, he's just, uh, he's... He's not a man of power, but he's in the service of men of power, and he, he always tries to do the best thing. I think Davos is a very well-constructed, uh, good character. Uh, who would I like to see on the Iron Throne at the end? Hard to say. Uh, I don't know. Um, Daenerys, maybe? Uh, I think she would... Uh, who knows what we do, but I, I don't see any of the brutality and the sort of casual viciousness of the Targaryen line in her, I see a much more developed and human person, and she might, she might not be a bad person to, to have the reins of power. She certainly seems to do a good job with you know the opportunities that come to her in difficult circumstances. George also mentioned relatively recently a possibility of a Game of Thrones movie. Okay. What do you think about that, and what would you like to see happen on that big screen? I'd love to see Roderick come back. That would be. <laughs> I, I think you know, given the scale and the success of the series, it, I imagine you're looking at the same kind of thing that happened with something like Star Trek, aren't you? You know, you, you go from uh, the small screen to the big screen with with relative ease. I would have thought uh, whether they would do, you know, repeat stories of what people have seen already. Whether they would take a different aspect of a, a storyline that hasn't been, you know, well developed or extensively developed. Because you know, there's so much of the books that you know is mentioned but doesn't get the same depth that George gives in uh, in print so yeah anything like that would be fabulous I think I think it would suit uh, I think it would suit big scale 
single productions very, very well. What was your reaction when you saw Joffrey die on screen? Just delighted. <laughs> just, I mean, it is, I think it's one of the things for anybody that reads the books, you know, from very early on, you're just sitting there going, you know, it will be a very good day when Joffrey finally gets it. So I think, every, you know, the really communal cheer around the world when... Uh, you know, he, he finally got what was uh, what was coming to. And finally, what would you like to say to fans of the show who are watching this video? Oh, thanks, you know, thanks for thanks for enjoying us. Thanks for putting the show up where it is. And, uh, you know, keep on, keep on watching, keep on having good fun.